Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second webinar. We'll just give it a couple more minutes um, to let other people log on if they need to. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us this evening. And um, before we get started, um, I just I'm assuming that everyone that's uh, logging in today has is a member of the Facebook group. But if you're not, have a search of UK Declan Sci Applicants Reflective Space on Facebook um, and also uh, Clinical Psychology Community UK, which is my YouTube channel. So uh, hit subscribe to that one um, and you can keep updated with uh, all of my future webinars and future videos and content. Um, if you've got any questions throughout, please type it in the chat um, and I'll try and respond in the Q&A section. Um, if you just want to say hi, that would be great too, just so I know that there are actually humans there. That would be nice. Um, but yeah, welcome guys and thank you very much. I will just give it another minute or so just uh, letting people log on. Okay, let's make a start then. So uh, you are logging in today to find out about the John's 2006 reflective model and also we're going to discuss the Driscoll 2007 model as well. Um, our aim today, yep, is we're going to do an introduction to reflective models um, and a little bit of an extension uh, from last month, uh, last month's webinar where we talk, talked a little bit about reflective practice in clinical psychology. I will outline and discuss those two models, the Johns and the Driscoll uh, model, um, two of the most popular models out there. Um, I'm going to give you some examples um, of when I've used those models. Um, and I also uh, had a, a great volunteer, Jodie, so good evening Ju Jodie if you're watching, um, uh, who volunteered to come and help me out with this a little bit. So she, um, her and I had a little discussion last week uh, about some of the pros and cons of one of the models, it was the, uh, the Johns model. <laughs> Lovely. Hi, guys. I've got your comments. Thanks. Hi. Nice to see you. Thanks for logging in. Um, all right, then. So as I say, if you've got any comments, just uh, pop them in the chat today. So what is a reflective model? Um, I think a lot of the time when we hear reflective model, we think it's this big thing that only psychologists know about and it's a bit secretive and you'll learn about it. But actually, this using reflective models has been unbelievably helpful for me um, in terms of thinking about myself as a practitioner um, and as a clinician and, and where that puts me in terms of training um, and in my own personal development. So it's not elusive, it's something we can all do. So a reflective model that helps you think about your practice, basically. Um, they quite often come in the form of a cycle. Um, so one of the ones, the Driscoll one that we're going to look at today is a cycle. Um, so that it will show you it's very cyclical in nature. Um, you start thinking about what went wrong, what went right, how you can do it better next time. And it goes around like that. Um, or it could be a set of prompts or questions, um, which is the John's model has a has a set of um, prompts and questions. Um, so it really depends on, on you and how you like to reflect most. And reflective models can be retrospective or current. So when we say retrospective, um, kind of going back to what we were saying in the last webinar, um, if you haven't watched the last webinar, by the way, uh, it's on the YouTube channel. Um, so have a little look on that. And it's also on the Facebook group. Let me know what you think. Uh, so it can be retrospective or current. So retrospective is thinking about reflection on action. Um, so thinking about a clinical experience or some feedback that you have had it's in the past, you're looking back on it um, or it could be current. So uh, having a clinical experience or yeah, having a conversation with somebody or presenting something and thinking about how you're doing that. Um, yeah. And reflective models can well should really be a, a, an essential part of keeping a reflective portfolio, um, which is the topic for our next webinar. So uh, if I start talking about portfolios, it will become clear next week. The two models we're going to discuss today are largely retrospective. Out it, uh, you're thinking about the experience after you've done it. But uh, the way that they are, it will make sense when we go through it. The way that they are um, helps you think about what you're doing as you're doing it as well. 
um, because you start thinking about the reflection and the set of prompts that are in there. So you already start thinking about it while you're doing it, and that can therefore change your practice. As I say, it will become clear when we go on. So the first one we're going to start with is the Johns model. So this, this one is split up into different sections. We have looking in, looking out, um, and in looking out there is personal, ethics, empirics, and reflexivity. Loads of different words there, right? And then we have a plan at the end. So I will give you an example of this um, as well. So it hopefully will make a bit more sense with that. So if we're looking in, we're looking in into the experience description. Think about that. Looking out is thinking, so personally, why was I affected by this? How was I influenced? Uh, what previous knowledge or experience has influenced me? Thinking personally, thinking in terms of ethics is something we will do anyway. Um, but uh, it's um, thinking about whether you acted for the best. So whether you acted in your best interests and more, most most of the time in terms of clinically, um, in the, in the service user's best interest, in the client's best interest. So really thinking about the um, possible dilemma that you might be in or, or thinking about the ethical consequences and impact that, that might have. Uh, empirics uh, refers to knowledge. So thinking about what knowledge has informed you, uh, has any previous experience and the knowledge that you've gained from that, has that changed the way that you've acted in that situation? Um, and reflexivity is, yeah, just thinking back about what your practice was, how you were, would you do anything differently? What could you continue to do that was good? And then I like a plan. <laughs> so having a plan in there is really important about what you can do next time um, or you know, continue to do. So I split this up. Um, because it, it, the way that I've done it when I use it is I've done a, a Word document. So I have different spaces, which I'll show you later. Um, but I will also post in the Facebook group so you have access to that template so you can use it yourself. Um, but with John's, the first thing that you're thinking about is what is the situation that I'm going to reflect on? So any situation it could be a clinical experience. It could be anything. And then you're thinking about looking in. So these are the different prompts that the John's model contains. So looking in, you need to be thinking about the thoughts and emotions that seemed significant to you. What was it that was um, most salient for you when you were going through that experience? Was it anxiety? Uh, could it be that you were thinking, oh my God, I'm not doing this right, which is usually my response. Um, could it be, um, actually, this is going really well. Uh, maybe I could ask this question. Let's see how this could go. Any thoughts and emotions that seem significant, basically. And then if we think about looking out, so in this one, which is why I've sort of set it out like this. So um, what you'd be doing is describing the situation surrounding your thoughts and feelings. So maybe explaining your thoughts and feelings, maybe um, analysing them a little bit, maybe thinking about um, why they why they are the most important ones, why are they, why are they significant as opposed to other emotions? Why are those thoughts and emotions stronger than others? Um, what issues seem significant? That could be with you, it could be with the client, the service user, it could be with the colleagues, it could be, it could be anything. What issues seem significant? What was I trying to achieve? So what were you trying to achieve? Were you trying to improve someone's well-being? Were you trying to um, do a bit of psychoeducation and impart some knowledge? Was that what you were trying to do? What were you trying to achieve? And also don't be afraid to think about what you are trying to achieve for yourself. Um, that's been the basis of a lot of my reflections, uh, is thinking, how is this helpful for me in terms of my progression, particularly onto the doctorate? You know, I know it's not the end goal, but it is a stepping stone, quite a large stepping stone. Um, but thinking about how that's helpful for me. Why, what was I trying to achieve? I was trying to get the best experience possible, potentially. Um, so uh, why did I respond as I did? That could, that, you know, that could be anything. Why did you respond as you did? Is it that you're tired from the night before? Is it that um, something about something the service user is saying is me? Is it anything like that? Um, what, th this is a really good part of this because it helps you think really holistically and broadly about the impact of your practice and 
um, your work on people around you, which is really helpful as a psychologist thinks about themselves in the context of others. Um, that's a really central competence. Um, so what were the consequences of that for my patient, others, myself, colleagues, anybody, anybody in the room, anybody? What were the consequences? Um, was it that the patient um, or service user uh, picked up some new skills that were really helpful for them, that they went home and practiced it, that they came back and reported they were great? Could it be the opposite? What was the impact? And, and when you're thinking about what were the consequences of that for myself, for yourself, think really honest my reflections as if nobody ever is going to read them. <laughs> ever <laughs> so I, I allow myself to be really really honest because I, I don't think up until that point I think particularly for me I was trying to act as the best clinician that I could rather than be that best clinician that I could and I think being honest it might not always be nice things that I'm saying particularly about services it might not be you know I've had some very challenging experiences it might not be um but it's important to be honest, uh, it's really important. Otherwise, I don't think your reflections will have the value that they could do unless you were honest. So how were others feeling? Um, and how did you know this? Because I think a lot of the time we think that people are feeling a certain way, but actually it could just be that they're thinking. So my thinking face is this. And if you, and if you just saw that, you might think, oh, she's very angry. Why is she so angry? Um, but actually, I'm not. I'm just really concentrating on what I'm saying um, and what someone else is saying. So how did I know this? Is it that their face, their facial expression? Or is it that they told me that they were upset or angry or anything like that? So that's really important because I think that that takes... Um, that you kind of take a step back and it's more objective. So when we go into the different categories, so we have personal ethics and empirics. So personally, why did I feel the way I did within the situation? Why did I feel that way? Could be anything. <laughs> Again, a lot of mine, a lot of the time seemed to be, I was, um, I was tired, I was hungry. <laughs> I was trying to do the best. I was nervous about people watching me do something or, you know, whatever it is. But you've got to be honest. And what factors were influencing me? Yeah. So it could be that you've just broken up with someone. It could be that you just had an argument. It could be, I don't know, you've just lost someone. It could, it could be anything, really. And it's really important to acknowledge that. It's OK to be affected by things. It's really OK. Um, I think that's one of my biggest pieces of learning as well is that it is OK. It's OK. And it's normal and it's human. So it's OK. Um, ethics. Um, did I act for the best? Simple. Um, but you can think in terms of yourself and you can think in terms of the service that you work in or um, and, and particularly for the service user. So if you're working with particularly vulnerable client groups, uh, learning disabilities, uh, dementias, things like that, um, ethics are hugely hugely important um, so having that consideration in your reflections is really helpful um, and what I've found in terms of having the ethics part in there is that I find myself thinking about it more prominently than I probably would have done before I will you know you we all think about ethics all the time it's super important um, but I, maybe maybe it's just not quite as uh, yeah prominent um, yeah so empirics what knowledge did inform me or could have informed me? This I really like because it links, it could link to psychological theory. So it could link to psychological theory. It could be as I'm working under a CBT model that this, this and this happens or this, this and this is the theory, that sort of thing. Um, or it could be uh, actually maybe a, a compassion focused framework might be more helpful in this situation. Um, and, and if you're not sure, then Google it, have a look, see what else might work. Go on some of the assistant pages on, on Facebook or, or even our group. Say, has anyone had this situation before? And um, what psychological models do you think might be helpful here? Do, do some research and put it in there um, because that knowledge could have informed you. That's really important. The other thing is what knowledge and experience have you got already that has informed you in this? So um, for me, for example, I used to work in substance misuse, as I said, um, and we had a lot of very aggressive 
service users and a lot of behaviors that challenge a lot uh and i managed to develop some skills in managing that and uh, not just in terms of the situation itself but in terms of you know risk management and staff debrief and as well looking after myself in that situation um so if that situation were to arise again or something similar then that knowledge will have informed me and um w i will feel much more comfortable um, so that will be, you know, a thread all the way through my reflection is that I've had that experience before. And how does it differ to my um, previous experience? Yeah. Thinking reflexivity then. So this go it goes on to exactly what I was saying. So does this situation connect with your previous experiences? Yes. A lot of the time it will. But if it doesn't, that's fine. It's OK. It doesn't know everything has to connect all the time. And actually, it's really good to have lots of different experience. Um, and, and instead of it just being, this question could just be a yes or no question, but really you need to reflect on that. So does this situation connect with your previous experiences? Uh, yes, it does. How does it? Why does it? Was this one better than the last one? Uh, is there anything else that could help you? What could you do next time? All of that. How could I handle the situation better? What were the consequences of alternative actions for the patient, myself or others? What would they be? That's a really important one because I think we often think, yeah, this would be good and this will be fine and we'll, we'll do this next time. But actually taking a minute to break it down and slow it down and really think about what is the action, the impact, sorry, uh, think about that. What is the impact for me if I make changes to my practice? Think about that. What is the impact on the service or my supervisor or my colleague or, you know, anything like that? It really takes time to break it down. How do I feel now about this experience? So this is a, a big one for me because I try and reflect on things pretty soon after they happen. Like if there's something that I feel I, I really want to spend some time thinking about that and reflecting on it, I'll try and do it fairly soon after the experience. But if it's something that I still feel some sort of discomfort or disconnect or maybe is resolved or I still feel like there's a bit more reflecting to do then I'll go back to it um, and this question is really important when you do that it's really interesting to compare how you felt in the situation how you felt immediately afterwards and then how you feel maybe a month two months six months 12 months afterwards it's really interesting to see how how it changes and I think by doing that you will learn more about yourself than if you are just writing a reflection I think you will learn more about your development and what situations help you. Um, so, for example, when I first started working in substance misuse uh, as a team leader, it, I, it was in a town that was much, much more, um, had a lot more crime, had a lot more violence um, attached to it. Uh, and I was absolutely petrified of going there, absolutely petrified. Uh, I'm really glad I did and I knew that I needed to. But if I think about how do I feel about that experience before, absolutely terrified, wanted to run away. I just didn't want to do it. If I think about how I felt immediately after I left, I felt relief was my overriding emotion. Thank God I'm out of that. I don't feel in, in danger anymore. Um, no, I think there were safeguards within the service. I'm not saying the service was particularly dangerous, but I, I still felt my threat response was activated. And then if I think about how I feel about that now, I actually feel quite proud that I've done that. Um, and it's interesting for me to think about how how I've changed. Um, yeah, so that's really important. Revisit your reflections. Um, yeah, support myself and others better as a consequence, because at the end of the day, I suppose that's what we're trying to do is to to support people as best we can and help them make changes. And how available am I to work with patients or families and staff to help them meet their needs? So you can look at this sort of two ways, really. How available am I? Uh, am I available in terms of scheduling? So <laughs> am I available? Uh, what hours am I available? Nine to five, weekends, whatever you work, whatever. Um, and how available am I emotionally as well? Uh, that's really important. So then we come on to the plan section. So what could you do differently next time? What could you continue to do to help you next time? thinking I think because those those two parts are essential for reflection a lot of the time um particularly if you're reflecting on a situation that maybe could have gone better um 
thinking about what you can do differently next time is really important but equally thinking about what you've done well is really important um I was having a similar conversation with my supervisor today uh about my critical voice my critical inner voice um and I think I, I can say all the right things and say yeah I'm going to continue to help um I'm going to continue to do things well and it's all good and I know that I'm good at things um but it's another thing actually believing it and thinking it. So, yeah. So as you can see, the John's model is quite big. Um, and I'm going to go through an example. But with the John's model, I mean, what I think is really good about this is that it's quite, it is quite accessible in terms of you don't have to answer all the questions. This is how I use it. Maybe you do have to answer all the questions. But in my experience, I answer the bits that seem to resonate with me the most. Um, and help me get things out of it. Um, like I want to avoid a question, I reflect on that and think about why Why am I avoiding that? What is it that I'm scared of or stuck with? So with this example that I'm going to go on to, I haven't, um, uh, I haven't used all the prompts necessarily, um, but I'm going to talk through a situation. So this situation is working with a complex and high risk client a, um, I'm going to call them, in substance misuse. Um, this was uh, someone who was um, maintained on an opiate substitute medication. He was uh, dependently drinking. He was homeless. Uh, he was banned from most of the town centre shops. Uh, he was vulnerable to, for, to financial abuse and physical abuse. He's been beaten up quite a few times. Um, heavily involved in the criminal justice system. Um, very, very unhappy, um, as you might imagine, because that situation is really, really tricky. Um, yeah, so that's a bit of background about the situation. So looking in then, when I'm thinking about um, what are the thoughts and emotions that seem significant? The thing for me, the first thing I think is that they're too risky to manage alone. And I don't necessarily mean loan working. I mean, uh, alone for me, having that responsibility. I might not have clinical responsibility as a, as a team leader or a caseworker because I'm not the registered manager and I'm not the registered clinician. But you still have to protect yourself because one day we will be registered clinicians with competence to have a, an understanding of that. But I knew that this person was far too difficult and risky for themselves and for me to manage alone with me um, as their key worker and also as a service. This person, yes, they had a substance misuse element, but they had mental health, they had safeguarding, uh, they had criminal justice, they had a lot of different agencies working with them and it was not safe for me to just try and tackle substance misuse, which was never going to change without that, that approach. Um, anger and frustration regarding the multi-agency approach that was required and did not happen. Um, I requested several meetings, referred to several agencies. It was a constant battle to try and get anything done with this person. Um, and curiosity. Um, what is causing the challenging behaviour? Is it um, that they can't communicate their distress? Is it that they are intoxicated? Is it that they don't trust services, professionals? Is it, you know, it could be lots of different things. So working out what it is is important. Um, and failure, uh, that, those were important. I felt like a failure because I wasn't able to help this person to make changes. And that's another thing about being honest because I knew in my head that this person was risky and that we needed a high level, high intensity approach with lots of agencies to make it work. and. Um, we weren't able to get that. And that's not down to me. I know that in my head, but there's still a part of me in my heart that goes, oh God, you could have done a bit better there. Maybe you could have sent a few more emails or referrals or escalated it higher, you know, whatever. There will always be that critical voice for, for me anyway. It's just how much I listen to it really, I suppose. So looking out then, the issues that seemed significant to me were that client A's level of risk was increasing homelessness, all of those those different things. What we had was an agreement for them to go to detox and rehab, which is a huge, huge commitment for somebody. Um, and usually they have to uh, engage a lot in um, groups or psychosocial work um, so that they are prepared for that really intensive stuff that happens in, in a rehab, which is nine to five, Monday to Friday, 
and then evenings and everything focused on who you are as a person and what's gone wrong for you and how you make it better. And that is intense. That's hard work. Um, so we had an agreement for this person to go without any prior work because they were so high risk. Um, hmm. um, which, uh, yeah, I mean, what else can you do, to be honest, in that situation? It's, it's really, really tough. And I think the people that made the decision were trying to do the best for, for them. But I was also trying to do my best in the context of the service I was working in and the resources I had access to. Um, and the processes that, that govern the service and, and things like that. So, yeah, those are the main things for that one. I'm guilty that the plan wasn't appropriate. Um, I Now I reflect more, I, ref, I think more strongly that the plan might not have been appropriate. Um, and I feel like I maybe could have said more. I don't think I could have done realistically in the situation I was in. But that's what personally why I felt that way in the situation is that I just wanted to make them better, really. Ethically, did I act for the best? Did we set the client up to fail by sending them to detox and rehab without any prep work? Don't know. Possibly. Arguable. But we will never know that. And and it's not like we didn't try. We, we did try. We tried so, so hard. I can't tell you. Um, and empirics. What knowledge could have... Um, could have informed me seeking guidance from the psychologist in the service or reading published published complex cases that could have helped me how did how has this been done before maybe speaking to rehabs who have had people like this before um i mean what knowledge did guide me as well this person was part of our mdt risk management um panel uh so internally i referred them to all of the right places and externally so we did as much as we could it's just potentially getting some more help um from a psychologist particularly having clinical supervision would have helped in working out what we could do with this person um and reflexivity so client a was definitely definitely one of the most difficult cases i've ever worked with it was so hard professionally and personally um, and the bit of context is I was a team leader at the time and I was given this person because they were so complex and high risk and that was sort of part of my role. Um, and it, it was just really hard. And I, I, I kind of feel like it was a bit of a rock and a hard place situation. Um, and it was hard professionally and, and personally to, to take that home was really hard. Um, so I completed a retrospective formulation that helped me understand the case better. So that's been something that I never did when I was a caseworker, when I was a team leader. It's just not something that I understood. I you know, hadn't been supervised by it or knew. Um, so I completed a formulation that helped me understand it better and helped me think like what that challenging behaviour is about and what are the snags, I suppose, in, in getting um, to the solution. And I still feel uncomfortable reflecting on my practice um, and that that organisation continues to manage service users in the same way. But again, I don't think it's necessarily the service. I think it's the way that it's commissioned and the way that things are funded. I think it's I think it's a far broader issue than just um, my job with this um, client. It's, it's far broader than that. And, and I think it's tricky. But I still feel uncomfortable on my um compliance i suppose with with the system um yeah i still uh, uncomfortable is the word i definitely still feel uncomfortable i could look at whistleblowing policies and discuss with a trusted person or a line manager you know i could could have done that or i could do that in the future um if i wanted to so that's just thinking about what i could have done could have done differently so the plan then i would use reflective models to reflect on experiences while they're occurring and afterwards as well which is not again this is fairly new to me this is not something i did when i was working there so that's definitely something i would do now and i would compare the situation with my values and ethics if i think what is important to me is acting in the person's best interests and broadly i do think that happened i think we really did act in their best interests and we really were um an advocate for them not in, in a professional advocacy term but we really stood up for them um yeah and don't be afraid to speak up and discuss concerns i think having a, a psychologist and a clinical supervisor is is helpful for that um because uh they formulate things in a different way so yeah that's uh, that's helpful um so this is the word document 
that, uh, that I use when I am going through John's model. So this sets it out a little bit differently for you and it might be easier for you to follow it that way. Um, I will make sure that that is available on the Facebook group. Um, so on the Facebook group, there are different learning units. So uh, unit one was last week's, uh, last month's webinar. So that has all of the resources on. Uh, and uh, this one will be unit two and it will have all of this stuff on. All right. Um, so I'm now going to talk a little bit. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> it's a recording. Um, so Jody and I had a discussion about the pros and cons of the John's model. Um, so uh, we, uh, yeah, I'll let you uh, crack on and listen to that. If we start thinking about the positives, some of the um, pros about the John's model. Um, yeah. The first one we've got on there is reflections include social context of reflections, and it's good that this can create a less individual focused reflection. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? I really like that because I feel like some of the models, um, when I've tried to use them, they're quite... Um, they almost put the onus on blame um, for you as an individual. And obviously my context of using reflective practice is often around challenging behavior. Mm. Um, and it's not about blaming somebody. Yes, we might have done something that um, caused upset, but um, often there are lots of kind of factors at play. And I just really liked the way that it kind of, it was almost like the first thing that it makes you kind of go, okay, so what's the context for this individual? Um, and thinking about um, the kids that have come back, some of them have not been in school for a number of, um, months mm. um, and they like you know they're just settling in they're figuring out what's going on they're building relationships with new staff you know you kind of have to recognize that and I really like that that's kind of like that top bit to kind of go okay so what's the context here what are we, mm. what are we talking about oh I agree really yeah like I that. I really like that um, as part of it because I don't think a lot of other models um, encourage you to think that way um, so it's well I know I think thing. they kind of sometimes I think they assume you do but mm. it's actually having the prompt to make you question it as well I think is really mm. important yeah and actually in practice we do that all the time we often think about the social context of things don't we so it's it stands to reason that we should do it in our reflection but mm. definitely yeah definitely. and I think that that kind of comes on to my next point that I then thought of as, mm. as a positive um is the fact that I really like having a structure mm. <laughs> which I mean maybe it's because I work with autism and we like structure but sure. um I found I find that um that I've tried some of the free flow stuff um where you're just kind of like writing your thoughts and almost like, like having a dialogue with yourself um and I just I just kind of I go off on a tangent and I don't really know what I'm reflecting and I kind of read it back and I go I'm not really sure that's reflective that's just a, a, a like rant about something it's just um, I'm the same I like just, having the structure yeah. just kind of pulls you back Mm -hmm. I'm the same because sometimes I'm writing it yeah I'm writing it and I think this isn't really going anywhere I'm just sort of writing what I think and how I felt and that's not there's no structure agreed I'm exactly the same I John's is no. one of my favorite models I think it's I like that structure mm. and I like the amount of prompts that are in it um because it helps you yeah. think like we said about social context it helps you I haven't seen another model that yeah. really considers ethics um no, and again definitely. it's such a central part of our practice anyway trying to think ethically and what is morally correct um what's the best way to do things in the best interest of the the service user mm -hmm. but it's never it's never in reflection so it's i like that no, and, prompt. And i think just almost i think it's it almost can just be reassuring can't it because you mm. can kind of just think of it and go yeah no i was working ethically like and i was sort of following this and um you know and if if, if at every point you kind of went or oh, was i you've mm. kind of nipped it in the bud before it's become like an embedded practice where you're kind of going down a slippery slope of something. Absolutely. Um, so I think it's really, really important. Like my, part of my role is thinking about um, uh, like restraint and um, and the impact of restraint and things like that. And I think it, it is a really like lovely thing to kind of just bring in and go, you know, actually, yeah, we, we managed that and we didn't need to restrain anyone. That's really positive kind of thing, which is, is quite nice, I think. Yeah, because something like that is always, you know, last resort sort of thing, isn't it? So yeah Definitely. yeah and ethical Definitely. considerations are important I don't know I, yeah I, I just think that's a really lovely prompt I really like the fact that that's in there um mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and I think that's like we said about the structure I think the amount of prompts that are in there as well with putting in what knowledge could have helped you in this situation that could be psychological mm -hmm. theory it could be previous knowledge that you've got of the patient you know it could be any it could be to have in there as well definitely definitely I think it's really again really lovely just to kind of although it might be underpinning what you do 
to actually take a moment and reflect and kind of go oh yeah I did that because of this is really really important mm. um and just like I like I haven't experienced it in the same like the because of the way it's prompted um with John's I haven't kind of experienced it like that and it was just really nice to kind of draw it back and go oh yeah do you know what I'm talking about like it's mm. nice <laughs> mm. and it, it's, it's interesting with this one because I think because there are so many prompts it could maybe feel a bit constraining but I mm. the way that I think kind of matches the prompts it makes sense to me you know it's, it's we always say with a reflective model try and find some that really work for you and resonate with you and this one is one that res resonates with me for that reason um yeah definitely. so I really yeah so it's good I um, think I think um because it was my first experience using John's and had, mm. had like, I had, I've had a couple of goes um and I think the first time I saw it and I saw the prompts I was like oh it's quite overwhelming there's lots to think about but actually once I started I was like oh no this actually makes like a lot of sense and and I could see the flow of it um, yeah. But yeah, that first time I was like, oh, this is a little bit different, but they're actually quite logical things to think about in a way. Um, yeah. It just pulls your attention to them instead of relying on you thinking about them like that. Yeah. yeah. And I think it flows quite nicely as well. Um, mm. I think a lot of it flows nicely. I think it makes sense. It just makes sense in my head. That's why yeah. I quite like it. And I think yeah, if, no. you, if you like a reflective model, if you like a way it's done, then I think it makes it easier to reflect, doesn't it? You know? engaging with service users or, or doing something having a clinical experience if I'm doing something I start thinking about some of the prompts thinking okay yeah. well when I reflect on this then what about this so yeah, it helps definitely. embed it I think doesn't it yeah yeah one thing I do because I'm someone I'm interested in reflective practice um and although I've had it quite embedded in the way that I work um I think it, if you were completely new to it I feel like it, the prompts might be quite overwhelming um, and I feel like there are sort of some that mm. could be good to start you off. Mm. Um, but I but I think if you've got the hang of those, this is a really good stepping zone. Um, and I think um, in terms of kind of building up your practice, I feel like there's sort of some other bits that are good to try. Maybe mm. that would be my feeling. I feel like if I'd have done this first, I might have gone, well, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and kind Agreed. of felt a bit um, like it was too difficult. Whereas I think because I've had practice and um, it's definitely been on my kind of mind um, of late that I think it was a nice stepping stone and, and a good experience to use it and I'll definitely be using it again. Mm, I, I completely agree with you I think because I'm sort of fairly new-ish I'm not actually like I think I'm maybe downplaying it there but um, I'm fairly new to reflective models and I, I've done a lot of freehand reflection I've always done that I've always mm -hmm. been able to do that um, but yeah it, I think because I've had that foundation I understand what reflective practice is and what I'm trying to get out of it I think yeah. then I find John's easier so I think you're right I think you do need to have some sort of foundation understanding and, and experience in reflection before it, it makes sense yeah yeah and it feels less exactly. overwhelming yes exactly I was about to say I think it's just quite overwhelming just because of the number of prompts which are really mm. good but I think if you haven't experienced it and you don't know how to use those kind of reflections and have that kind of okay I've had an experience what did I think about it what am I going to do next yeah if you have that as a kind of thought process it might just feel a bit almost yeah like overwhelming and too much information um, yeah but and yeah the one, one thing I felt like um it was kind of missing compared to some of the other models that I've used was it didn't I didn't feel like it had so much focus on what went well because I mm. think sometimes we often reflect on the things that we found hard and difficult and challenging yeah but it's really nice sometimes to reflect on things we did well like it's mm. like sometimes my team come back and they're like oh yeah that really really well and I'm like that's pretty good let's focus on that like why did it go well what what happened to things and I think that was one thing it didn't kind of prompt in that what what mm. like I don't know I just kind of was missing that prompt to go okay so what was good that you did kind of thing which sure. is probably in there it's just an explicit question to help you recognize it I think is really really good mm. because things that go well is just as valuable as learning from mistakes or things that might you know areas for development it's just totally. as important and I totally. think it's important for your confidence in your practice as well not just yeah not just um thinking about well how can I improve definitely you know. well because if you only focus on the negative things so you have your reflection you've got your outcome of what you want to learn from it if you then apply that and it really really works but you never reflect on it then you don't really realize that your reflection kind of got you there in the end do you know what I mean yes. like it's sort of you it's almost, like a lot of them are circles for a reason aren't they because you kind of go round and round yeah but at some point you hope that it's going to go well if it doesn't go well then you probably need to reflect go back and reflect again but, well exactly yeah um and obviously this you know sometimes it's different context with like a different client and a different um team or something yeah which might affect it but um yeah like I feel like you need to kind of keep going around 
yeah with all the positive stuff as well which is really good definitely I'm terrible at actually I say I'm good when I'm good at picking other people up and I'm good at recognizing in other people but I'm not so good at doing it myself but mm. yeah and that's an interesting yeah. reflection in yeah. itself isn't it that's an interesting <laughs> thing to reflect on like wow well because I'm I'm exactly the same and I mm. I wonder whether it's because I was saying in my first webinar I was wondering if well-being wise it's just I need to do psychology 100% of the time and don't look at anything else ever yeah yeah <laughs> And I need to improve. And if I'm, I'm not improving, then I'm not doing anything. And blah, 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 and it's very scary. Um, yes. Yeah. So I think if we just be a bit kinder to ourselves, we all need to do that anyway, don't we? No, um, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I think yeah, and have a bit of compassion. Mm, exactly. I think one of the other things for me that's missing from this model is a like a really explicit plan section, because I, I think I like to ha make a plan and stick to it and do it and make things better with a structured plan um yeah yeah so that for me is missing I think that there is there's a bit on it but it's not quite as structured as some other models yeah no I think I think some of the others definitely kind of end on that kind of yeah what what you're doing next time kind of thing mm. whereas it was there for sure but I don't, it almost felt a bit like an anti-climax in a way because you've done all these reflections and you've got all these sort of prompts and then you kind of get to the back and end and it's a bit like, okay. <laughs> and what, so yeah, I think it is, it's useful to kind of, um, yeah, have that in mind at the end maybe to mm. kind of focus a little bit more on around, around action plan. I definitely felt that the prompts that it gives, um, even if you were using a different model where it might focus a bit more on the action plan, I thought those prompts were really useful in mm. terms of actually, even if you, you could use those prompts around the different areas, like around ethics and knowledge, you could use those but using a model that you're more familiar with, if that makes sense. I kind of yeah, like they were really. things to have in mind. And mm. like, I know maybe you're not supposed to, but like merge all the different models together and kind of find one yeah. that actually works. Why not? You. Yeah. Maybe. I'll get yeah. it published for that the next thing. Exactly. Be the next model. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. Um, Instead of being right to ripping off everyone else's things, to be fair. But anyway. <laughs> but that's the other thing with John's. Because there are so many prompts, I find myself not always... Um, I'm not always answering all of the prompts. I'm not always addressing yeah. all of the prompts because yeah. I don't always need to. But it's kind of nice to have that choice there. So I can, it's, yeah. you, you do still have quite a lot of scope with this model. You still can yeah. reflect in lots of different ways, which is nice. Yes, yeah, yeah. I definitely, I, the, the sorts of things that I was reflecting about, I felt were quite um, like singular experiences. Mm. Um, and I would be interested in the future um, to kind of do it in a bit more of a kind of broader context so something a bit more I don't know um, if I'm trying to kind of uh, implement a strategy with a team maybe kind of reflecting on kind of a series of events maybe mm. whereas I was kind of trying to focus on a bit more kind of singular events partly to do with having been off for the summer and kind of going back to work I didn't feel like I had that kind of like story to reflect upon with a team um, so possibly about um, maybe after the half term or something, I might like to revisit it with something about how something's gone. Um, mm. And I don't know how I don't know how easy it will be to apply to that because I haven't done it yet. But um, I feel like that it might be more complicated, but yeah. also it might be really useful as well. Um, the revisiting it, it's quite what I was going to say is it's quite a lengthy reflection, like reflective yeah. model, isn't it? It's quite yeah. I, I feel like I need to sit down and do a reflection with when I'm doing this one, whereas some yeah. others it's a bit lighter and a bit quicker and sometimes um it's it's a bit quicker to revisit and stuff. Yeah. But then I suppose you get quite a deep reflection with this one, or you can, depending on how what you do with it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And it's a possibly even that kind of broader experience might even be better for it in a way, mm. because because um, maybe, it, yeah, like you say, it's more in depth and like you're really mm. asking lots more questions about something that you've experienced over a longer time. Mm. Um, so, yeah, sure. I definitely think I'll revisit it again mm. um, in my um, in my reflections moving forward for sure. Well, that's good. We've got, well, if you're going to use it in the future, that means it must be yeah, a good yeah, model yeah, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no matter what negatives, definitely. It's definitely something to kind of explore and, and try a little bit more with, for sure, definitely. Yeah. No, it's been really, really helpful. Thank you so much. That's all right. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Hi, guys. Um, one of the things I should have done is introduce Jodie <laughs> so you actually understand who she is. So Jodie, uh, thank you again so much for, for doing that for me. Um, she is a senior behaviour coordinator who's currently leading a psychology team working with uh, children.
and she's planning on applying for the Declan side this year, so best of luck. I've um, got another thing to pop on the application now, so <laughs> so that's good. Um, lovely. So I'm just going to summarise some of the points that we said. Um, so in terms of um, some of the positives, contains a lot of prompts. It considers the impact on service users, colleagues and ourselves. There's links to external knowledge, psychological theory, things like that. Um, and develops reflective practice skills and also considers ethics. Some of the negatives. Now, it does not include a plan section. I put that plan section in because that's who I am as a human being. I, as I said in the video, I need to have a plan. Um, but there isn't quite a, a, a structured plan section, as I said. So, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't have that. Um, prescriptive. Is it possibly too many prompts? Is it quite overwhelming? And is it quite scary to think about all these questions? And blah, blah, blah. Is it also quite a lengthy way of reflecting, as I said? Um, you have to really sort of sit down and do a reflection. Um, is there any overlap in any of the looking out sections, essentially, or any of the prompts? And focuses on what went wrong rather than what went well. It's a bit, bit more focused on that. Not that, you know, you can also include what went well in there for you. As I say, you can make, you know, make this personal to you and what's important to you. It's one of my favourite models. Um, particularly when I first started using reflective models, it really helped me think differently about my experiences um, and, and what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I think lot, largely it is one of my favourites. I mean, as I get a bit more practised at, at reflecting, um, I, I think some of the quicker models are now I'm finding them easier and um, so we'll come on to that so moving on to Driscoll then so what is the Driscoll model broadly it is what so what now what uh, but here is the broader cycle so uh, having a clinical experience is the first thing that you start with then you go to the first sort of question what a description of the event um, what happened basically give, give a little description and then what you're doing is purposefully reflecting on selected aspects of the event. So what's what's important to you? What resonates with you about that situation that you went through, um, about that clinical experience? What's important? So what? An analysis of the event. That's what we're doing. We're thinking about how the event went. Was it good? Was it bad? What, what was good? What was bad? How was it good? How did we know? All of these sorts of things. Um, discovering the learning that arises from the event. So really spending some time to think about what you've learned from that experience. And then now what? Proposed actions following the event. What is it that you could do following that event, following your learning? How can you implement that learning? What are some possible things that you could do? And then the last stage is to action that new learning, to put that into practice. Um, and then it's a circle. So next time you have a clinical experience, it's the same. How did that learning go? How, how, how was it? Um, has there been any impact on your practice this time? So broadly, what, so what, now what? Those are the broad questions that you're going with, going for in, in this Driscoll model. So if we talk a little bit about an example then. Um, so uh, this uh, is actually another substance misuse um, case because I've just got so many to choose from. I've got a plethora of them. Um, so this is client B. Uh, I was working with B. So how was I working with them? I was their caseworker, again, as um, a team leader because they were quite complex. Uh, they had some mixed learning disabilities um, and also uh, were on the autistic um, spectrum. Uh, and they were in treatment for alcohol misuse. So what was the situation? Communication issues, broadly. Um, they were unable to communicate with me how much alcohol they were drinking, which is quite key if you're treating someone for alcohol addiction, I suppose, alcohol misuse, and you need to know where you're starting from, because particularly with alcohol, if you reduce too quickly, that can um, result in seizures and even possibly death. So it's really, really essential that you know exactly how much they're drinking or have a rough idea. And um, so you don't advise anything too drastic. Um, they were not able to communicate that with me. And I didn't know, I had a few questions about that, so which I'll come to later on. But I was wondering why they were struggling to communicate, why we were struggling to communicate with each other. Um, so thinking about purposefully reflecting on selected aspects of the event, my discomfort, I was very, very uncomfortable with this situation because I had never 
experienced this situation where I was just not able to get anywhere with somebody because we were not able to communicate effectively. Um, I had a lot of pressure from uh, the service because it was very, very time limited. So uh, with this person, I ended up seeing them a lot, like weekly for individual sessions. And we were a group service, so we couldn't really do that. And um, as I say, this person was a complex case. So it was agreed that they could they could have that that intervention. Um, but there was a lot of pressure while well, they've been in treatment 12 weeks. We need to sort of get them out of treatment now. But we had not changed. I still didn't know how much they were drinking. So that was hard. They also attended with a support worker. So they lived in supported housing and their support worker was clearly, clearly this client meant a lot to this support worker. And they had a, they seemed to have quite a good relationship. Uh, and they were very concerned about client, the client's drinking. Um, but the client was quite reserved with me in front of the support worker when the support worker we, we trialed it one one session where I said do you mind just not coming in for the first five minutes and then and then I can kind of have a little bit of a chat with the client um on their own um and they said yeah that's absolutely fine so and and the client consented also uh and so they they were a different person they were able to speak a little bit more openly and it was a bit concerning maybe uh, it, it it promoted my curiosity, piqued my interest um, to, to work out what this support worker dynamic was. So those were the selected bits that I picked out from that experience. So what? What did I do? So I sought supervision and support. So the first uh, thing we did was to refer them to the multidisciplinary MDT uh, complex case panel, uh, it, which was for complex cases, anyone that sat outside of our normal treatment pathway of groups. This person clearly was not going to be able to engage with group, and um, so you know, and had lots of other uh, issues. So they were so they were referred to that. Um, and when the outcome was one to one working, that was fine, and um, that that was the decision. And I tried my best that way. Then I sought supervision from the forensic psychologist that was uh, employed by the service who was really helpful um she took the time to sit down with me and really do a consultation and figure out what my concerns were what the concerns were for the clients um any possible ways that i might be able to adapt my practice to work with learning disabilities um and then I, and thinking about how well things were going and how badly things things were going um what was important about thinking about an analysis of the event the key questions that came up for me about the communication so uh i had was he was he unable to communicate with me was he misunderstanding or not able to fully understand my questions was the language that i was using um too confusing or not direct enough or was that was a some sort of issue there was it that the support worker was making him he didn't want to say in front of the support worker um, was it that he didn't have any motivation to change his alcohol use? Um, was it that he actually wanted to keep drinking and the support worker didn't want him to keep drinking, obviously? Um, you know, he was an adult with capacity, so he can drink if he wants to. Um, just because it's a bad decision doesn't make it, um, doesn't mean that they have no capacity. So those were lots of the questions that arose for me. So then thinking about the learning that arises from that event, it taught me things about the way the service was structured um, uh, and, and ethically how my practice was in terms of working with this person with um, with communication issues and what was right. Uh, Multi-agency working difficulties, so I referred this person to social care and there were lots of issues in getting them an allocated social worker and getting a multi-agency meeting together. Um, so there were lots of, that, that was a lot of learning for me as to how best to do that. Um, so moving on to the next stage, now what? Um, what are the proposed actions following the event? So reflections, again, I wasn't doing these reflections. I wasn't really spent having the time to think about the situation that I was in and what support was available and what knowledge could have helped me. I, I just wasn't in that place. Um, again, I would continue to seek support as I did and raise my concerns as I did within the internal um, and external channels, the appropriate channels. Um, and ensuring that the service user who probably, I think a lot of the time with learning disabilities, people get 
that you would speak to the support worker or the carer you wouldn't speak to the person themselves um and that was really important to me was to speak to the person speak to the client because it was his life his treatment yes the support worker had um pressures from her service and a duty of care um but it was really important um yeah for, for me to speak to them and see what they wanted because that's actually what a lot of behavior change and substance misuse particularly is all about is motivation so it's really important to not only assess their alcohol use but to assess their motivation as well um, and actioning new learning so i made a plan um with myself uh obviously i'm not in that situation anymore i'm in a different role now um but thinking uh i now do lots more reflections and i seek support and i feel more comfortable to raise concerns um, and i'm actioning that and actually that makes me feel more confident and more competent and more comfortable in clinical situations clinical experiences it's far easier for me um to do that now um so as you can see that that model is a lot shorter um it's presented as a cycle so if we think about some of the positives and some of the negatives this one's presented as a cycle which works really well for some people they like it to be cyclical they like it to make sense and it all links together i'm i kind of like that structure i do like it it can be used quite quickly and this is one of the examples of some of these prompts i now think about when i'm in a, in a situation you know what so what now what and it's particularly the the so what and the now what i think um it can be revisited easily as well because it's so quick you know it's it's very easy to think about what, comparing two clinical experiences doing two reflections and comparing them it's, it's very easy using this model there is a plan element included which i'm super into as you know um with a focus on development um and that's again that links back to it being a cycle because you are <clears throat> sorry you are implementing your learning and it can be memorized for embedded reflective practice as i said reflection in action it's it's easy what so what now what easy easy to think about easy to yeah hard to forget that one so if we think about some of the the cons to it then arguably is it too simplistic uh, do you actually need more prompts than that i mean when i first started reflecting i found this model quite tricky because i didn't really know what i was doing i didn't know what sorts of questions to ask um so what so what now what could potentially be too broad for, for some people you might need a little bit more guidance there and if you do i suggest a model like john's to start with um it's about what find, what is best for you finding what's best for you and it may not allow for deeper reflection i think as we said sort of in the video the john's model allows for a deeper reflection um potentially uh but this one is but a, a bit lighter potentially but again because the questions are so open what so what now what i think you can do with that whatever you want and like jody was saying in the video taking different parts from different models so in the what section you might be thinking about what thoughts and emotions seem significant for you which is part of the john's model so they kind of it just helps you it helps you reflect that's all um it does not explicitly consider ethics or additional knowledge and um, that's true you know like the john's one like i said it, it, it has ethics in it and it has external knowledge it has a section where you can explore that um this one might do too it, you know you could uh, in the driscoll one you could have um proposed actions or learning from the from the event you can you can then go and research you can go and think about psychological models and put that in there too so you can do it i just don't think it's quite as obvious as with the john's model um and limited applications is it best for a clinical experience because that is what it says in the <laughs> in the cycle um i would probably say yes i think it probably is best for a clinical experience if you're going to do it that way i think the three questions what so what now what can be used for anything um but this particular one where you're picking out selected events and, and the whole cycle i think probably is best for a clinical experience Whereas something like the John's model, I've reflect, I've used the John's model to reflect on um, my, some of my biases, reflect on being a white middle class uh, female, young female in her 20s who is an assistant psychologist. It's all very predictable. Um, so I've, I've tried to reflect on that and think about uh, about my experiences and what makes me who I am and, and in terms of the doctor application and, and, and things like that. So. I think John's is potentially more versatile. So we're going to come on to a little bit of a comparison. So the John's one obviously contains a lot of prompts. Driscoll contains few prompts. Um, John's is more linear, whereas Driscoll is a cycle. 
John's is a lengthier reflection, Driscoll is a shorter one. Um, there's sort of no explicit plan section with John's, but there is in Driscoll. John's might arguably allow for deeper or more personal reflection, whereas Driscoll might be a bit more of a situational reflection, um, thinking about what's in the environment that's affecting this, what can I do differently, how is the service structure, that sort of thing. Both of them can be revisited. Um, and I don't necessarily think one's better than the other. I think whatever resonates with you, whatever works for you and helps you think differently about, about situations, I think that's the most important thing. Um, that goes for any anything to do with reflection. Just find what works best for you. Try some out. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? Nothing. You can't do it. You'll be able to do it. It's just what you enjoy doing as well, what you think is useful to you. So I'm going to come on to the question and answer section now. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. But to start us off, um, I have got uh, a question actually that I didn't receive in from somebody, but I felt this way when I first started using reflective models. So this is why I think it's really important, because if you are new to reflective models or reflection, this um, this might hopefully help. So I feel constrained by using reflective models. What would you suggest? I, I hope that you've understood throughout this webinar that, uh, as I just said, um, focus on finding something that works for you. That's the most important thing. And I think some models, maybe the John's model with all of the different prompts, you might not feel comfortable um, to do that. Use more open models like the Driscoll model and, and other models that we will come on to. You use more open ones like that, less prescriptive. Consider using a freehand reflection. So as I said uh, in the last webinar, what I used to do is, is sort of keep a reflective journal thinking about anything really it's just a free hand just thinking writing and thinking and reflecting you can do it that way if, if you if you find that helpful then do that if you find that really helpful for your reflection and your practice do it um you can consider discussing reflections with your colleagues potentially or your friends and your family um we do this all the time i do this all the time like I will ring my dad. I spoke to my dad earlier, actually. I will ring my dad and just tell him about some situation that's going on that I'm not quite sure about or I feel uncomfortable about. And it, I'm not going to ring my dad and say, Dad, I'm doing a reflection right now. It's not going to happen. I'm just saying, oh, I feel really uncomfortable about this and I don't know what to do. What do you suggest? Your partner, it could be a friend, it could be anything. You know, you could do it that way. Or even do a video diary if you want. Do a webinar series. You can do, you know, whatever works for you um, is, is the bottom line of this. Um, but also, if you are going to use like a prescriptive model like John's, you don't have to use all the prompts, like I said. You, you don't have to. Um, so I think what would be useful, that's an interesting reflection in itself, is you feel constrained by reflective models. What is it that's constraining about them? What makes you feel uncomfortable? Are you scared of, of reflecting? Are you, what is it? To think about that, maybe use a different reflective model to think about that. Why am I feeling really stuck about this? Have I got a previous experience where I feel stuck about something and these models make me uncomfortable? You know, what is it? Um, what do you feel you can't fit into any of the reflective models? Or could you create a section, create a new model, like Jodie said, to take the bits that you like? Maybe you could do that. But in doing that, reflect on why you're making those choices. Reflect on that. Think about that. Why Why you're making those decisions. Why don't any of these models fit you or think that you fit them? Why is that? That's really, really important, I would say. Has anyone else got any other questions about anything else I've spoken about today? Reflective models in general? Clinical psychology? Anything at all? I haven't received anything so far, so I will assume that nobody has any questions. If you do, you can always comment uh, later or on the Facebook group, um, send me a message on the Facebook group or anything like that, and I'll uh, try and address any questions that do come in, come in later. All right. So in summary, then, reflective models can be useful for revisiting reflections as part of a reflective portfolio. And a way to dedicate time to reflective practice is really, really helpful. Just being able to sit down and really think about that. Um, 
a variety of situations, uh, clinical experiences, supervision, feedback. If you're at uni, it could be um, reflecting on feedback that you've had for a project or an essay or something like that. And again, this is a point that I made in the last uh, last webinar, but reflect non-judgmentally. If you are reflecting something saying, um, I felt angry at the, I felt frustration towards the client because they were not listening to me or something like that, feel that way. It's a natural human response. It's really, really helpful. Uh, so just reflect non-judgmentally. You're a nice person. Nobody goes into psychology to be a horrible person. Um, so just allow yourself that. Um, and reflect non-judgmentally just be honest with yourself don't show anyone the reflections it's like your diary you don't show anyone that maybe I don't know um oh I've got some great comments thank you so much guys that's really really helpful um I've also got a question uh from Beth thanks Beth would you recommend using reflective cycles in applications explicitly or more to inform the content for example naming reflective model used within subheadings or using it for a general common thread do, uh, do you mean um oh uh do you mean uh the doctor application or like assistant jobs or other jobs in psychology I suppose thinking about um we are going to talk about this in the next webinar, um, which I'll, I'll introduce in a minute. It is uh, keeping a reflective portfolio. There you go. Uh, and uh, reflecting in a doctor application, because that is my biggest piece of learning from this um, cycle round of, of applications. Um, so my this is my opinion. I am not a, a qualified psychologist. I don't teach the selection process for doctor applications this is just my own personal experience um this is the first year where i've actually reflected in properly reflected in my application the first version of the application that i wrote this year reflective models for example john's 2006 that's that doesn't really tell you anything actually because anyone can use so what i actually have done is put in there about things that i've reflected on um about myself so for example uh, I've actually 